Louisville's theorem gives us a new way of looking at dynamical systems and their evolution and provides us with additional context for what it means for a system to be Hamiltonian. But recall that we have already explored the nature of Hamiltonian systems and discovered that Hamiltonian systems have symplectic structure. If we define a state Z composed of our generalized coordinates and their conjugate momenta, then we know that we can write the time derivative of the state Z is equal to the symplectic matrix J times the gradient in Z of our Hamiltonian, which is a function of the coordinates and momenta. This ties in to a branch of mathematics known as symplectic geometry. And we're going to now briefly review some of the basic definitions and results from this field insofar as they further illuminate what it is for a system to be Hamiltonian. QP is known as a symplectic manifold. This is a smooth manifold, which formally is defined as a differential topological space. And it has what is known as a closed non-degenerate differential two form, which formally, again, is a rank two skew symmetric covariant tensor field. Okay, so that was a lot of very, very specific mathematical language. Let's take it one step at a time. A manifold is a topological space. The topological space is a collection of points along with neighborhoods. So it is a space in which we can define some kind of distance metric. And for every point in that space, we can define a neighborhood around that point. A manifold is going to be a space like this that locally resembles our Euclidean space that we've been using all the time. So if you zoom in closely enough on any one of the points making up this space, this manifold, you can treat that local neighborhood as a local Euclidean space. Furthermore, we require this to be a differentiable manifold or a smooth manifold, which means that those local Euclidean spaces, vector spaces, are close enough to the true Euclidean space that we can do calculus on them. Our symplectic manifold is a smooth manifold of this kind that's equipped with this thing called the symplectic form, that closed non-degenerate differential two form. A differential form defines an integrand without the use of coordinates. As an example, let's define u to be an open set on the nth dimensional real numbers, r to the n, and we are going to define f as a smooth function on u. Then we can write, for any vector v in the r to the n space, the directional derivative operating on f evaluated at a point p on u is going to be equal to the time derivative or the independent variable derivative of f evaluated on p plus t times the vector v in the limit as t goes to zero. So this thing, dv f of p, this directional derivative, is a linear function of v, and it is a generalization of the partial derivative. So we can write the derivative of f, df, as a summation of the partials of f with respect to xi times the derivatives of xi for any coordinates xi on u. This is the same kind of thing that we've been doing all along in our various derivations. And we can similarly write df evaluated at p is a summation of the partials of f with respect to those coordinates on u xi evaluated at p times the differential xi in the limit of p. And this thing here is known as a differential one form. We can further generalize this and write alpha p is the sum over i of functions gi of p times the differentials of hi at p. This is a one form for any functions g sub i, h sub i defined on our open set u. And we can map this to coordinates as alpha is the sum of some set of functions f sub i times the differentials of the coordinates xi. So we want to map this back to our understanding of 
the differential forms that we've been using in our various derivations. So the question that we're asking here is, given alpha, is there some function f on u such that we can get alpha to be equal to this thing df? Well, if we use these definitions, we can write the sum of the partials of function f with respect to the coordinates xi times the differentials of the coordinates is equal to the sum over i of functions f sub i dxi, where we are using f sub i in place of the partials of f with respect to xi. Remember that we defined f to be a smooth function, and for any smooth function, it must be true that the second partial of the smooth function f with respect to xi xj is exactly the same as that same second partial with the order of the differentiation reversed. That's one of the criteria of smoothness. And so f must require that the difference of the partials of fi with respect to xi and the partials of fi with respect to xj must be zero. And the reason why we are going through all of this is because we can, based on this, define a new operator. And that is called the wedge product, otherwise known as an exterior product. This is, again formally, an alternating bilinear form. And it's analogous to the outer product in linear algebra, but it's much more general. If we have a k form alpha and an L form beta, then the wedge product alpha beta is going to be a K plus L form. So much in the way that the outer product that we've been using in our tensor operations is dimensionality adding, so too is this wedge product. If we have vectors V, W, then the wedge product of alpha beta evaluated at point P on VW is going to be equal to alpha P of V times beta P of W minus alpha P of W minus beta P of V. This is that alternating bilinear form. Geometrically speaking, we can map our, this wedge product, at least in three dimensions, to our understanding of the vector cross product as follows. If we have two vectors, alpha and beta, we've previously defined their cross product, alpha cross beta, as the vector that is orthogonal to both of them that has a magnitude equal to the area of this parallelogram formed by their edges. And so this area is the wedge product alpha beta. So if we put together all of the above, we have the summation over ij of the partial of our functions f sub i with respect to xi times the wedge product dxi dxj is zero from the smoothness constraints. And so we can now write d alpha is the sum over j of dfi wedge product dxj. This is the exterior derivative of the alpha two form. Okay. This was unbelievably abstract and delved very deeply into some deep, dark nooks and crannies of topological formalism. What does this have to do with anything? We can now circle back to the symplectic property of Hamiltonians and Louisville's theorem. Louisville's theorem tells us that any infinitesimal phase space volume is going to be conserved. What that is really telling us is that the wedge product dp dq is itself a conserved quantity. So what makes a system Hamiltonian? This is the fundamental statement mathematically of Louisville's theorem. And the other statement that we've been carrying along all the time is that h is constant. These are the two necessary and sufficient conditions for determining that a system is Hamiltonian. Ideally, our numerical integrator must preserve both of these properties when integrating a Hamiltonian system. Otherwise, you are no longer integrating a Hamiltonian system, you're integrating something else. 
And sadly, it turns out that you fundamentally cannot get a numerical scheme that conserves both of these things perfectly. And this is provided in a, multiple different proofs, uh, one of the earliest ones being in G and Marsden, their 1988 paper. In essence, the result here is that a Hamiltonian system would have to be fully integrable in the first place for such an integrator to exist. There cannot be a numerical scheme for non-integrable Hamiltonians in general that preserves both of these properties. So you basically have two options. Your first option is to exactly conserve energy. That is, just focus on this number two here. This is achievable by things like implementation of discrete Lagrange's equations, which are described in papers by Ito and Abe. And the problem with this is that while you are conserving energy perfectly, you're losing phase information. Your position and velocity magnitudes will be correct because they must be in order for the energy to be perfectly preserved, but the components will drift in a somewhat random fashion. And so if you are interested in where objects are in your Hamiltonian system, this is a bad approach because you will explicitly not get the right answer other than the magnitudes of positions and velocities. For our purposes, for the integration of n-body systems, where we very deeply care about where the individual bodies are at a certain point in time, this can't be our approach. So let's forget about perfectly preserving energy and instead focus on conserving the symplectic structure. That is, focus on making sure that this is a constant. We find that when we build these symplectic integrators, energy is usually, but not always, conserved as well. And the higher order the integrator, the better job we do in general of conserving the energy.